Hey, what's up you lot, Path here. And in today's video, like I promised you guys on the communities tab and on my Instagram page, I'm going to be doing a Q&A because on this channel, we have hit 50,000 subscribers. That number is wild. I, I'm really in shock. So thank you so much for every single one of you that has subscribed. Thank you so much for every single one of you that leaves comments and leaves really nice messages in my Instagram folders. And sorry, I can't get back to all of you. Uh, and as well as this, if you watch my videos and you like them and you support me, then I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. So like I said, I asked you guys recently on my Instagram page and on the communities tab on my channel to send me your questions so I could answer them in this Q&A. Let's go through them. A few of you have asked me why I chose physics as my degree or my major, whatever you want to call it. So I'd like to take a moment to answer that question. When I was much, much younger, Math used to be the subject that I thought I was good at, not physics, because uh, obviously we didn't study physics that early on. But there was one specific turning point, at which point I realized I want to study physics, and it was reading a book called Dead Famous, Albert Einstein. It was a book about Albert Einstein's life and work, basically, but explained at a level that, you know, young children will be able to understand it. And I've actually made a video about this in the past. Check it out up here if you haven't seen it. I can honestly say that reading that one book got me hooked onto the physics lifestyle, and since then I've not looked back. Physics is difficult, physics is interesting, physics is tricky, it's messy, it's a wonderful subject. And I'm super thankful I was privileged enough to be able to study it, let alone at one of the best universities in the world. Why is there a gravitational constant? Wouldn't the equation work without it? Now the best way that I can think of describing this is that the gravitational constant is a constant of proportionality. If you don't know what that means, let's talk about it. In a very, very simple case, looking at just an abstract idea, we could say that one particular quantity is proportional to another. What that means is that if we increase one quantity, if we say double one particular quantity, then the other quantity doubles as well. And equally, if we treble one quantity, the other trebles as well. And if we halve one quantity, the other halves as well. If we imagine a situation where, just to keep it simple, we've got a star, let's say our sun, and a particular planet, let's say the Earth, then we know that there must be a gravitational force between these two. They're massive objects, they have mass, and therefore they exert a gravitational force on each other. And as it turns out, this particular equation here looks a bit complicated, is the equation for the force exerted by one object on the other and equally by the other object on the first one, assuming that the mass of the first object, in this case, the sun is m1, and the mass of the second object, in this case, the earth is m2, and the distance between the centers of these two objects is r. So to break this down in a way that I feel is relatively intuitive, if we were to take these two objects, let's not think they're the sun and the earth anymore because we can't change their masses. Let's say the first object, we could double its mass. If we doubled its mass, then the gravitational force between the two objects would double as well. Equally, if we return back to our original scenario, if we now double the mass of the second object, again, the gravitational force between the two would double. And if we increase the distance between the two objects until they were twice as far apart as they were before, then the gravitational force would decrease by a factor of four, which is two squared. So doubling the distance actually quarters the force and trebling the distance actually one ninths the force. And so what we've discovered here is that the gravitational force between two objects is directly proportional to the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two objects. But all this does not tell us anything about the constant of proportionality. This is where the gravitational constant comes into the picture. This is just a value that's measured experimentally. And some people like to think of this proportionality constant as the strength of the gravitational field. I mean, we could talk for days about how the masses of these objects being larger means that the gravitational force is larger and how separating them decreases the force by a factor of r squared. But this tells us nothing about what the actual values of that force are going to be. And the only way to determine this is by experimental testing. And it turns out that in our universe, the value of g is 6.67 dot 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 times 10 to the power of negative 11 meter cubes per kilogram per second squared. In other words, if we were to take a mass of one kilogram and another mass of one kilogram, and we were to place these two masses one meter apart from each other, then the gravitational force between them would be 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons. So to answer your question, yeah, the gravitational constant is important. Without it, none of our equations would work, it, you know, gravitational equations. And it's basically an indicator of how strong gravity is, at least in our universe. This is why the gravitational constant is thought of as one of the fundamental universal constants, because it just has a particular value. And in our universe, it happens to be 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. Whereas maybe in another hypothetical universe, it's slightly stronger. So for one kilogram mass and another one kilogram mass, and they're both one meter apart from each other, maybe the gravitational force would be larger. 
How have you been spending your time during this pandemic? Any fun, cool, exciting things? Thanks for that question. That's a really nice one. Uh, I have been doing what I would say is a fair amount of stuff uh, in, in this quarantine. I'm lucky enough, like I say, to be able to stay at home and work from home as well. And so obviously I've been making a few more YouTube videos than normal. Recently I've been uploading one a week rather than one every two weeks. I might have to switch back to once every two weeks in a, in a short while, just because things get a little bit hectic. But in my spare time, I've been doing as much exercise as I can at home. I've been using the space I have available. I can't go out and play badminton, of course, but you know, home workouts are good. Keeps me sane, stops me from going crazy. And mostly I've been working on some music on the side as well. I've been recording some of my own music and I'm getting very close to being able to to release a track. So if you're interested in uh, listening to some of my music, then head over to my second channel, which is going to be my music channel, Path G's Shenanigans. And so that's been my life in quarantine, relatively repetitive, but I'm super, super thankful, like I say, to be able to be at home, to be able to work from home and to be healthy and happy and with the rest of my family and so on. How does light act as both particle and wave? Is God playing dice with it? Now, this is a really good question. I think the first thing that we need to realize is that the idea of a wave or a particle is inherently a human idea. People in the past have seen certain behaviors in the universe around them and said, look, this particular thing is displaying this kind of behavior. I'm going to call it a wave. And some other scientists have seen some other things behave slightly differently and they've said, I'm gonna call this a particle. And the idea of how waves should behave, as well as the idea of how particles should behave, is based on experimental observation that scientists have made, as well as sort of theoretical development based on the wave and particle models that humans have created. So it's not that light, as well as other things in the universe actually, flip-flop between wave and particle behavior. That's not what's happening. What's more likely is that we as humans have just not come up with a good enough model to describe what's happening in our universe. For some reason, we've seen some wave behaviors and we've seen some particle behaviors not realizing that they're two sides of the same coin, maybe. I think that's probably the best way that I can put it. And so we've come up with these two very distinct model, waves and particles. Whereas in reality, a good model would be an idea that consists of a bit of both. And maybe, who knows, one day we'll come up with a model that describes wave and particle behavior and it sort of comes out fairly naturally from this new model. We could call it a particle or a pave, I don't know. So yes, scientists were surprised when wave-particle duality was discovered to be a thing, but it's more likely that some scientists in the past saw some wave-like behavior and developed that model, and for other things we developed a particle model, when in reality, for some things we should have been coming up with a model that ended up displaying both kinds of behavior. My goodness, that was a long sentence. But hopefully that answers your question. And if I haven't explained this clearly enough, then and if you've got any other queries, then do let me know in the comments down below. Can you make more videos on thermodynamics and heat transfer? Yeah, thank you so much for your question. I really, really do want to do this because when I was studying physics at university, thermodynamics was one of my more tricky subjects. And so I find that when I talk about these things on a YouTube video, uh, that my understanding improves slightly because I have to try and explain it in a way that isn't too incorrect. So yeah, I definitely want to do this. Like I said, it's a topic I still struggle with, but hopefully I'll be able to produce some videos that you guys enjoy. Can a person who has no innate talent in physics study well if he works hard? Yeah, I managed to do it. I mean, uh, I don't particularly see myself as a, as a really talented physicist or anything like that. Uh, I think I enjoy the aspect of explaining things, which is why I love making these YouTube videos. But certainly when I'm learning this stuff, I find it really, really difficult. I'm not super talented. I just have to keep grinding away at it until I find a way to understand it that works for me. So yeah, studying physics is really hard work. And actually it's pretty hard work even for the people who seem to be super talented. Hard work is always the key. It's all about not giving up. It's all about persevering. So yeah, take it from me, somebody who has no innate talent in physics. Yeah, you can do it. How do you make your videos? I mean, please tell us about your setup. Yeah, I want to do this. I want to actually make a video about how I make videos because a surprising number of you have asked me, uh, sent me messages asking me how I do annotations like this or you know what camera I use and what microphone I'm using and things like that. So I'll, I'll talk about that in the future. But because the majority of the questions that I get are about annotations like this, I'll just quickly let you know that I write my annotations on a tablet and then I take those annotations and then I combine them or compile them onto my video in Adobe Premiere Pro. Physics or biology, I don't know what to choose. I mean, you're asking a physicist here to give you an opinion, so obviously my answer is going to be a bit biased. You should choose physics, but I can sympathize with that, uh, with that dilemma. When I was thinking about applying to universities and such, I was split down the middle between applying for a physics degree and for medicine. Uh, eventually I realized that I enjoyed physics more and physics was more my calling and so on and so forth. And so I went with physics. How to beat stress. How can you have a relaxed life? I don't know the answer to this one. If anybody does, tell me in the comments below because I could do with a bit of help on that as well. Quarantine workouts, by the way, hair is chill. Thank you. <laughs> my hair is getting crazier and crazier every day and I'm having to do everything I can to uh, 
you know, tie it up, keep it out of my face and so on. But yeah, quarantine workouts. Um, Athlean X. Not much more to be said there. Okay, so at this point I've answered lots of your questions. I sort of went through all of the questions you sent me. There were lots and lots and lots of them, so thank you so much. I hope I've answered a good subset of the questions that you guys sent me. Hopefully you've learned something from this video, a bit about physics, a bit about me, and uh, thank you once again for 50,000 subscribers. I'm still not over that number, and I don't think I will be for a long, long time, so thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please do leave a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. And if you've got any questions or something that I haven't answered properly, or even if I've made a mistake, let me know in the comments down below. As I said earlier, I've got a second channel where I'm gonna be posting my music. I'm gonna be releasing a track pretty soon as well. So feel free to follow me over there on Path G Shenanigans and follow me on Instagram at PathVlogs. With all of that being said, guys, thank you for watching this video. I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.